Welcome to This Is ADHD. I'm your host, Chris Johnson. I was late diagnosed with ADHD. I'm a senior leader and a personal change coach, working with people that want to change their lives for the better. Um, in coaching, I work with people to understand what is getting in the way of making changes and how they can not only get that change, but also feel good whilst doing it. I typically work with people over a number of sessions, but in This Is ADHD, I use those same coaching skills to have a real conversation about what it's like to have ADHD. The conversations in This Is ADHD are about putting a face to the name, label, or diagnosis of ADHD, and showing that ADHD can't be described by a single conversation with a single person. And so that whilst my ADHD is almost definitely different to your ADHD, both of us are valid. In today's episode, I'm joined by Kendra Cock, the founder of Touchy Feely, and we talk about their late diagnosis. We talk about the myth of happiness and the ongoing challenges of ADHD post-diagnosis. And finally, we talk about emotional acceptance. Welcome to This Is ADHD. Today, I am joined by Kendra. Uh, good morning, Kendra. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, I'm Kendra Koch. I'm the founder of Touchy Feely, which is a sensory wellness marketplace for folks who are neurodivergent. Um, and I spent a good decade working in the wellness space. Um, I have a degree in psychology. I'm a mom and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. So thanks so much for having me today. Thank you for joining us as well. It's been such a long time um, since we originally agreed this. Um, so Kendra, I know you've watched a lot of the episodes, um, so you know the question that I'm gonna ask you. Um, what do you call your ADHD? I love that you ask that because until I heard your podcast, I had never really thought of it like that. Um, I just like, it's just this thing that I deal with, mm -hmm. but um, I like, it's technically inattentive type ADHD. Um, sometimes it's, it's helpful to me and sometimes it's not. So I try to not like personalize it too much or give it uh, too much of its own identity, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> no worries, no worries, thank you. And so when were you diagnosed or if you, were you diagnosed or are you um, self-diagnosed? I was diagnosed, um, I was 34 years old and it was a complete surprise to me. Um, I had been going to therapy for about five or six years, and this is a, a second therapist I had seen. I, I went to her for anxiety. I was just like really struggling at work um, and didn't completely understand why, and I just knew that I needed some help. So I went to a stress and anxiety center, and I had been seeing her for maybe over a year. and just randomly in the middle of the session, she's like, you know, you have ADHD, right? And I was like, um, no, I did not know that. <laughs> um, so that was, yeah, pretty shocking and surprising. And I, at first, I honestly, I kind of blew it off. I didn't think that much of it. Um, but she was really great about educating me and um, helping me understand like what the diagnosis means and what it meant for me. So um yeah, it was late and uh, very surprising in my case. I feel like I want to ask a difficult question. <laughs> and so feel free mm -hmm. to it's okay, yeah. reject it. Um, when you first had that co conversation about, mm -hmm. oh, I think you've got ADHD, and you kind of initially rejected it, I, I think I was very similar. What were your thoughts mm. pre um, that conversation about what ADHD was? It's a really good question. Um, I 
knew about it because I was a psychology major. Um, so I learned about it in university. Um, I also was an early childhood educator for part of my career and I encountered it in the classroom. So I was aware of it and I, I really didn't see myself in it at all. Like it wasn't anything ever crossed. Um, my brother also was diagnosed with ADHD when he was very young, like through the school system. And what I was told about it was that like these kind of labels are bad and they are harmful and they're limiting. And, you know, my parents were not very accepting of the label. Um, and at, with, in, at least with my brother, like I only heard of it once and it never came up again. Um, so I think in the back of my head, there was some disbelief of like, is a mental health or developmental disability diagnosis valid? Like, is it, is it actually problematic? Is it real? Um, I think I wasn't clear on what I believed about ADHD and spend a ton of time thinking about it, to be honest. Mm. Yeah. There, there's a really interesting sentence um, there, um, where you said, was it valid? Mm -hmm. I just, yeah. I think, I think that's a common thing with. ADHD diagnoses and pre-diagnosis of, well, I've only got a little bit of ADHD. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not severe. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just wondering if that kind of resonates. I mean, once I learned about it, I was like, oh yes, I definitely have this. Like this mm -hmm. makes so much sense and like my whole life made way more sense. <laughs> um, but before I really understood what it was, especially like how it presents in women, um, mm -hmm. And that there's different types. I really probably had the more stereotypical image in my head of like the super hyperactive boy, like kid, that is what you see in the media and what you mostly hear. And even that is what I was taught in school too, is that that's how it looks. It looks like a super hyperactive boy in classrooms. Um, so the validity part, I think once I understood more about it, I, really embrace the label as like a tool. Um, I know that some people think of it as an identity and like parts of me do, but I do think our identities are very comprehensive and not just one thing. Um, but for me, it's a tool to be able to get the resources and treatments and support that I need and to be getting the correct ones because I had been seeking help for like chronic migraines. Um, I had been treated for depression in high school and none of those things ever worked. Like I never really got help that worked. But then when I had the ADHD diagnosis and I got treatment for that, a lot of my other problems went away, like because I was getting treatment for the right condition. <laughs> so yeah, so like I think it's valid but I do think that there was, especially in the 90s, like when I was a kid, there was a lot of fear around ADHD in the media and like tied to, it was a lot of it was tied to like pharma, pharma medication advertising mm -hmm. and like fears that kids are being over medicated and all these narratives that I'm sure we've all heard. Um, and I also grew up in a very like religious a Christian environment where kind of the mindset was that God will heal you. And so like my whole community culture and family system was like not pro medication or treatment that was like mainstream science-based treatment. Mm -hmm. It was, so there's like that whole side of it too. Um, that was a very long response to no. your question, but I think, yeah, it's a big, it's a big question, um, for sure. It really is. It really is. It's, I think something that's sticking out to me is, and I've, I've not seen this in other guests and I'm quite interested in it, is you feel like you're very comfortable with the term disability and disorder. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've mm -hmm. seen quite a lot of pushback on using those words and um, 
I'm quite happy with disability disorder, but I was just wondering how you, those words kind of feel to you and if um, that acceptance was immediate or if you had to kind of come to it. Yeah, I'm comfortable with the terms because those are the terms we have. Um, I think the language is constantly evolving. And also, like, my experience was very much that I didn't know I had ADHD until I was an adult. And so it wasn't part of my identity as a child. It just was something that I learned was part of me later on. So I already felt really solid in, like, other components of my identity. And now I see how ADHD probably feeds into those things. But I um, I also feel like understanding the medical model, at least here in the US, of like what labels do and how they work with the system that we have and like what their utility is. Um, and understanding kind of like the history of the DSM, which I won't go into detail in because I'm not an expert on that, but I I do think that really learning about those things helped me feel more comfortable with seeing it as a disability because um, in order to get treatment, whether it's medication or psychotherapy or there's all kinds of alternative like treatments um, and to have it reimbursed through your insurance at least here in the US, you have to have a, a, a diagnosis. So that's really the utility of the label. It's like, mm -hmm. here's a category of symptoms that you have. And in order to get treatment for those symptoms, we need to like know what the cluster of symptoms is so we can match you to treatment and have that paid for within this system. That's kind of like the really logical way of looking <laughs> at it, but it does help me because sometimes I feel disabled. Like I, I never thought of myself as disabled growing up and now it is sometimes hard to accept. Um, I don't, I haven't really changed too much of like what I do and try to do. It is really just coming back to, like you said, that acceptance piece, but more of allowing the acceptance to give me some self-compassion because I think the most harmful thing for me at least, was like all the extra piling up of like shame and pressure and trying and struggle and like masking that I did to myself because I wasn't able to just accept and have compassion for where my limits are. Um, and I think that every human being has limits. Like I have a certain kind of limit and it's because I have ADHD, okay. I'm fine with it now. I mean, it's definitely taken time to get there. And there are days where I push against it for sure. And there are days where I see my peer group doing like really incredible things and feeling like I can't or I won't be able to do that. And then that can be hard. Um, but I do just try to remember, okay, I can't do that in the same way maybe I can do it. It'll take longer. It'll take more support. It'll take, you know, so for me, like the disability component is also a tool. It's just a way for me to think about how do I get what I need to still be able to do what I want to do in the world? Um, if that makes sense. It really does. I keep hearing this um, narrative that you, you've kind of said about it being a tool, being a tool, being a tool, getting what you need, getting the support, mm -hmm. understanding yourself and saying, if I want to do this thing, I need X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I learned that through, not through ADHD, actually, but I was diagnosed with chronic migraines when I was eight. So I've had like really debilitating periods of time where I had super severe migraines. Um, like when I was in college, I had them three days a week. So I was just a wreck. Like I didn't make it to class a lot of the time. And I was like, okay, so the only way I'm going to graduate <laughs> is if I get support and it's like, okay, who can support me? It's like, okay, I found a friend who would like give me notes after class. I found professors who would work with me and I talked to them. I found... So it was just like when 
I got diagnosed with ADHD, I was like, okay, here's, you know, here's another thing. Now that I understand what it is, and there's actually like other people who are going through this, I can learn from them. Like there's people who have known that they've had ADHD for much longer than me and have already adopted tools or had certain treatments. Like I can learn from them of things I can do to help myself And I can maybe adjust the things that I've just naturally, I think all of us like gravitate towards these like weird systems that we put together ourselves to make things work. Um, And a lot of mine were working, but they weren't ideal and they were too complicated. And so the diagnosis just gave me more information to make those systems better and more effective. And it also gave me like the ability to have better boundaries and communicate my needs more. Um, I think before it was really hard to explain to people like, oh, you need to repeat that thing you just told me like three more times because I didn't process it at all. Or like, I'm super distracted right now in in this conversation or in this restaurant because I hear like everybody else's conversations behind me. Like, I didn't know that other people didn't experience the world that way. I just thought like I was struggling a lot more than they were. So I was just holding all this shame. But now that I understand, okay, it's ADHD, it causes the brain to work like this. I feel much more comfortable being like, hey, I can't do that. Like I need to turn off that background music or go somewhere more quiet or whatever. And people usually respond fine. Um, So yeah, I think, I think it was something that luckily I learned earlier in life and just like applied to this to this, um, diagnosis as well. But, um, yeah, it's, it's not perfect. I think I'm still navigating how I think about it. And the more, the more people within the community I talk to, like it changes over time too. Um, but that's where I'm at with it right now. That's really nice. I'm just thinking about kind of setting boundaries because I know this is something that people really struggle with myself included. Mm -hmm. How do you, have that conversation with someone because I know it can sometimes be wrapped up in kind of anxiety and shame and things like that to saying actually I need something different yeah um I mean this is like the life practice (laughs) like intellectually (laughs) I know how to do it but actually doing it in the moment is so hard like sometimes I just go blank or I like start crying (laughs) like okay that's not working um I think it's just practice. Um, I read the book called Nonviolent Communication. Um, I will look up the author later and send it to you so you can, if you do show notes or whatever, you can put it there. But that'd be great. For me, that was the most helpful. Have you read that? um, That book. I've not heard that that one at all. That's completely new to me. Yeah. Okay. So I will. I can explain a little bit about the concept, but basically. It's a, a communication framework that's really grounded in boundaries and observations and your own personal experience instead of putting all of the, the weight of the ask on the other person in the form of like blame. Um, so it's a very neutral, confident way of communicating. And that book has probably helped me with boundaries more than anything else I've done. Um, because it gave me almost like a template for how to talk to people. And when things come up, I just, okay, go back to the template, which is like, just say what you notice. So then it's like, okay, it takes the emotion out of it. It's like, okay, I notice that I'm starting to get really distracted because I'm picking up that background noise or whatever it is. And then the next thing would be like, um, just saying, you know, how it makes you feel. And then so I could say like, okay, well, that's making me feel like a really bad guest on your podcast, because I'm not able to like be really present with you right now in this moment. And then the next piece is like an ask. So it would be like, would it be okay if we pause for a moment, I go turn off that, that music that's playing, and then we get started again. Um, And so like, it just sounds very light. And like, Mm -hmm. I never like blame the other person or make them feel like they did something wrong. And sometimes, you know, 
it is a harder boundary. Like, hey, I noticed, you know, like with with my daughter, for example, with her caretakers, hey, I noticed like she didn't drink water the entire day. Her water bottle was completely full when I picked her up from school. Um, that makes me worried because like she needs to stay hydrated for her well-being and she drinks like the whole thing when she gets home and then she like has an accident at night and I don't want that to happen. Would it be okay if you sit her down a few days and give her water versus like you're a bad teacher, like you need to make sure my daughter's drinking water and like all these things, you know, like those can have two very different outcomes, even though the ask is still the same. Yeah. So I just really ground myself in like that book and what it teaches and practice, practice, practice. And then of course, like the more emotional, the thing that you're trying to hold a boundary around, the harder it is. And so I love that. I think they do say in the book, but practicing it with your family can be the hardest, but the safest because well, it depends on your family. But like with my husband or my daughter, like that's where I've probably gotten the most out of it because I feel a little bit safer with them. So if I, if I mess it up, um, then I can say, Hey, can I, can I try again? And like a lot of times they'll let me. So, I mean, I, I, it took me like years, like years to mm. be able to do this. And it was in also in stages, like I could do it like at the coffee shop. Like I used to feel so much shame just ordering coffee and that's not healthy or uh helpful um and it's their job to like take my money and make me a coffee but i would feel so bad like i was putting them out so i just started there i'm like okay i'm gonna start with ordering a coffee and if they mess up my coffee i'm gonna ask them to fix it because this is what i need to do to practice being better with boundaries and voicing my needs so just like the littlest things um is sometimes all you can do and that's enough um and then over time you'll feel more comfortable with bigger things like this winter we went to mexico for our christmas vacation and our hotel was just not great like they tried to do this huge sale pitch, sales pitch when we got there and then our room was musty and we had like booked 10 day trip. We had no idea where else we were going. We were like not in the country we live in. And I was like, you know what? I'm not staying here. And I went, I called my credit card company. We got out of the reservation like a year ago. There's no way I would have done that. I would have just suffered through like a trip that I didn't feel completely comfortable in. And I would have felt terrible for wasting all that money like later. So um, I think it's a skill. It's a skill you can learn. And how does it feel in the moment now when you're making those, and it sounds really harsh, making those demands for what you're entitled to? Mm -hmm. It always feels awful. <laughs> like I get this like <laughs> giant pit in my stomach and I get like sweaty and like really uncomfortable and I feel like I'm going to suffocate <laughs> or like I start, I'm just, I feel teary just thinking about it. <laughs> um, but then after I do it and I see that generally everything is fine, um, yeah. it feels better. And like, yeah, it does. It, it's not comfortable at all. Like it's not at all comfortable. Um, but then I think I've learned that like putting off the discomfort just leads to like longer term discomfort, <laughs> longer term discomfort. Um, so it's like, do I want to feel really crappy for the next 10 minutes to an hour or do I want to like ruminate on this for weeks and weeks and feel bad about it for a really long time and not have anybody understand why I'm upset. Um, so that's another like thing I just put back in my head, which is like, do I want to feel bad now or do I want to feel bad for a long time? It's like, okay, I'll just get it over with, get it over with. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> oh no, no. Absolutely not. Yeah. So I mean, if it was yeah. easy, we'd just do it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. How about you? Like, how do you, how do you like to approach it? Or do you, um, how does it feel for you? Oh, it feels awful. It feels incredibly awful. And I can like, I can even see it on the behaviors that I have. Um, like subconsciously mm. I will drop my voice 
which is ridiculous, mm. especially when one of the things that I remember is if people can't hear me, I feel like I'm being a pain. So I'll drop my voice even further, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And it's that thing of mm. like, it almost like feels in my chest, like I can't get enough air in. Of kind of like it's it's not panic, but it is like constriction of going like I just don't know what I'm doing, and I get very tight and very condensed within myself. It's yeah, mm. absolutely awful. Um, one thing that I have noticed that helps is when I do it on behalf of mm. someone else. Is mm. is when I, I go actually, that, yeah. this isn't for me. But if I do this, I will feel better. Therefore, I will be better to be around for other people, which yeah, is really difficult. Nice. But it's that thing of yeah. I playing that trick on myself of saying, I know I don't deserve this, but the people that I'm with deserve me to be mm. better. So therefore, I'll, I'll play with that. And that seems to kind of get mm. me through sometimes. But with everything, these tactics only work intermittently. It's not this kind of straight road where I'm always challenging. But that, always you're right. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I think it's directly aligned with like what kind of life you live too, because it's easy to just like kind of set yourself in one lane and like, okay, everybody in my life knows what to expect of me. Everybody at work knows what to expect from me. And then you don't change anything. You're not going to run into those moments where you have to advocate for yourself or mm -hmm. notice that you have needs that are, maybe are different or feel like more than other people's needs. Um, and I guess maybe that's what my parents were worried about with the label, which is like, don't limit yourself by saying, Oh, I have all these challenges. I'm just gonna settle here where I think I'm comfortable and that's it you know but i think if at least with my adhd brain i can't do that because i'll get bored <laughs> <laughs> so you gotta keep trying stuff and then you have all those extra moments to practice <laughs> yeah boundaries yeah. are hard I think <laughs> yeah really hard really hard and i was just thinking as you were kind of talking there as well like i i work in quite a challenging field outside of podcasting um, on my day to day, mm -hmm. and quite often, what I will do is um, a technique from coaching, which is reframing, of saying, "You've you've just explained this thing to me. Have I fully understood it? Mm -hmm. Because if I've understood it this way, and they go, yes, I go, well, now I've because of that. How do you explain X, Y, Z? What are you going to do in this situation? So it's still mm -hmm. the challenge. It's still the conversation about why something isn't good enough." But it's giving that opportunity mm -hmm. and it's a very different conversation at that point. Yeah, that feels better because you're just like turning it around and looking at it from another angle. Um, yeah, that's a cool technique. Do you do coaching on yourself? Yes, yes. I, I do coaching on myself. Yeah. I have coaching um, professionally as well and I have therapy. So I have all the coaching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's not something people talk about enough, but we need other people um, to show us what we can't see. Or yes. in my case, it's often been less of people pointing out like what I could do better, but that I'm doing okay. Um, mm -hmm. I think that matters too. Just having somebody be like, oh, you're, you're actually doing fine. Like, you're where you should be given the circumstances. Um, this, yeah, coming back to the self acceptance thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think. Yeah, but there I don't. Big, I, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say that there's a, a big thing um, within my journey, but also within other people that I've seen of oh, I should be doing more, I should be more successful, I should be more X, Y, Z. And then mm -hmm. when someone looks at you from the outside and says, but you are successful, you're really re well respected, you're doing this, you're doing that. I'm like, oh, but I don't feel I don't feel that connection with those emotions, with those statements that are mm -hmm. objectively true. 
And I know I've had people um, kind of write into the podcast that's going, your guests are all really successful and really killing life and like absolutely nailing their ADHD every single day. I think it's really um, difficult. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like every single guest has got their own challenges, but um, I don't know about you. Oh, yeah. Do you want to talk about those? Because I do think it's important that people see that. Um, oh, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm like, I'm in the entrepreneurial space and I've worked in startups my whole life. And so I'm, my peer group is like pretty impressive. And I only look at them and feel in awe most of the time. Um, and I often have this kind of, pressure of like that's where I should be that's where I should be that's where I should be um but nobody sh shows the mess and like whether you have ADHD or you don't or you're dealing with other stuff like people never talk about that we just see <laughs> all the like accolades and the awards and the vacations and the like cool stuff and um and I'm sure that's what it looks like if people look at my things too. And I, tr I do try to write about like what's hard. Um, but even just like getting to this podcast, the first time we were supposed to meet, I like was half an hour late for our call because <laughs> I cannot, like, I cannot remember any appointments like ever. If I don't see it pop up on my calendar, I'm going to miss it 100%. So I have like a, this hack where I wear a, an apple watch and it like pings me okay but if that doesn't work for some reason i'm just screwed coming up and and it'll go off and it's like five minutes before the appointment and i'll already have like started focusing on something else and like also forget it so um there's all these like micro things that are just like so frustrating and nobody will ever see and like i hope no that um more people talk about it because they they sometimes are like so small that it's almost like not mentionable but then they add up through your whole day like i can tell you can't even tell you how many times i've like gone to there's a co-working space in my building i'll like go to work sometimes and i'll go down there and realize my computer's dead and i forgot the charger so i'll go back up and get the charger but I'll have brought my computer up with me and then I'll like leave my computer in my apartment and go back down with only the charger. <laughs> like this is so ridiculous. And all these tiny things just like eat up your day and make you feel frustrated and take up so much energy. And sometimes I get burnt out from it and then I'll just do nothing for like three days, really. Like I can't, I'll just be completely burnt out and I will do no work at all. Um, and I won't be social and I'll like barely be able to feed myself. And um, sometimes I get really down and I'm just like crying every night. Um, and I don't even really 100% know why sometimes I just feel down. And I think it's just like <sighs> changing the expectation of with ADHD, you're not going to be like linear about things, but you can still be successful holistically. It's just gonna feel really messy and hard. Um, but yeah, it's like, like we were saying, sometimes you need a third party person to look at your life and say you're doing fine because all I feel a lot of days is like, oh, I screwed up again, I forgot that again, I'm late again, I'm like, just like suck at life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And there's, yeah, I don't know. There's like the emotional hard part that is, I guess it's, yeah, the shame, the feeling like everything is confused. Like, I don't know if you ever feel like this, but sometimes I feel super confused because and I learned this is an ADHD trait, but like being really perceptive is common. And I also have a uh, complex PTSD, so it might be from that, but I am truly very perceptive and I doubt it a lot. Like 
because I'll bring something up and people look at me like, what are you talking about? And then I'm like, what am I talking about? <laughs> like, mm. I don't always fully know. Like, I don't always fully know what I'm feeling. I just know I feel something and I'm like, I need to investigate this more. There's something here. But until you can articulate it, people really look at you like, like, seriously, like, you're dumb. Like, I don't know what you're talking about and your problem. Like, stop making things harder than it should just, like, let this go. And something inside me is like, I can't let it go. And I think that emotionally makes me feel like I'm not crushing ADHD because it's like, why can't I be better at, like, immediately identifying what it is I want to deal with and deal with it now? It's like, it takes time sometimes to figure out what this thing is that I'm perceiving um, or like, you know, something's off, but you don't know what's off. And then like, it creates all this like fluster and mess around you. Like that would happen, me at, happen with me at work a lot where I would just be like, well, we can't do that. And then I wouldn't have a way to explain why I just knew we couldn't do it. Then of course, like three months later, it would turn out like doing that thing was a terrible idea and we should not have done it. And I could feel that, but I could never articulate it to make a real impact and not feel stupid at work. <laughs> mm. um, so I think there's all these like internal feelings that we deal with that you can't show on social media. Um, I don't know, do you have any kinds of things like that that come up or have people talk about in your community? I mean, myself, definitely. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was, I was yeah. thinking like there's that thing of, like there's that pattern matching thing of saying, I know something's going mm -hmm. wrong. I don't know what's happening. But I think there's also that kind of processing slower of saying, like, mm -hmm. I feel bad, but I don't know why I feel bad, and I can't work it out. And then there is the expression of that as well, of saying, I've got a, I've got a good feeling we're not going to make a success of this and not being able to justify that and not being able to argue the case because again you're processing slower and then there was another point mm -hmm. which might work and memory's gone <laughs> um what was it? i know i have that <laughs> it was it was oh, that was it it was um oh, i'm writing it down there's like it's a zero i don't know if i'm using this phrase right um the zero sum game it doesn't feel right like the right mm -hmm. phrase of no it's a, it's a no win situation because you either speak up uh, and you say yes. something's going to fail yes. and you can't explain why, so you feel bad. Or you don't say anything and then something goes wrong mm -hmm. and you feel bad because you didn't speak up. Or, you, yeah, you speak up and yes. everything's fine. <laughs> like there's, there's no winning in any of the situations. Yeah, it's so frustrating. Yeah, it's, it's really frustrating. Mm. I mean, when people think... Like, what do you, people think crushing ADHD looks like? Does it look like living a neurotypical life or like being really organized or like, how do you think people perceive that? I think people look at the famous ADHD as like Simon Sinek and Stephen Bartlett and Richard Branson mm -hmm. and go, oh, it's, it's being an entrepreneur. It's having like everything kind of successful and being out there. I think, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't know because in my head, ADHD is always going to be a struggle that's going to be with me mm -hmm. and I can, I can yeah. help myself and I can kind of work around it, but I don't know what crushing ADHD would look like apart from maybe being happy. Oh, happiness. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I changed my relationship with that recently because I feel, I feel like it's a weird goal. Um, mm. I learned about, I guess I started thinking about this maybe almost 10 years ago when I went to acting school. Um, I did like a conservatory program um, for Meissner technique, which is like an offshoot of the method um, that's supposed to be more about imagining yourself into the character. But what I learned from acting was that as humans, we have like the human, 
the full human experience and the whole point of acting is to reach all of the notes within the human experience like the emotional notes from high to low um and then i realized like well all of us have that it's not just these like extreme characters that are in drama like all human beings have these emotional notes from high to low and if we are striving to be happy all the time or even to be happy we're taking ourselves out of like the present in a way like we're taking ourselves out of like what we're actually feeling and there's beauty in every single and there's a like there's like um information in every emotion so if i'm always happy i'm not gonna notice that you know something in my environment or a relationship i'm in is not healthy for me i'm like feeling good about it i'm not reflecting on it i'm not thinking about it but if i like feel bad every time i go into a space for example that information can help me like move myself out of that space um and i do feel like I know we had talked about maybe talking about kind of like the wellness industry and to me it's super tied to like the this wave of like toxic positivity um where everybody is striving for happiness but I don't think it's possible first of all <laughs> to achieve like happiness as a state but I also don't think it's healthy that's like dissociating from a big chunk of your life um do we really want that like i i'm really questioning if that's something we actually want like because you can make yourself happy in every moment of the day you can like watch movies you love you can eat food you love you can just lay around you can you know you can chase things that make you happy even if it's like work or whatever like exercise things that are good for you too but then you're not in control of your life and you're not present with your life so um i've started to be like asking myself am i happy overall and am i just feeling a certain way in this moment like knowing that emotions will pass but it's like almost seeing happiness as contentment mm -hmm. um or like i heard someone define happiness too as like pursuit towards a goal like you're actually making progress towards a goal that you have it's not reaching the goal it's just making progress towards the goal is what makes us happy um and like in acting we heard we learned a lot about all these actors who get oscars and then after they win the oscar they're like super depressed um and it's because they've achieved their goal and now they're not making a uh, they're not pursuing their goal anymore and they've lost kind of the meaning of their life um i don't know so that's how i think about mm. happiness now to get like very philosophical on you but mm -hmm. um yeah i i do i do worry about the whole cultural pressure to like we should all be healthy like happy and wealthy you know mm. maybe that's not what we all need yeah yeah, I kind of see where you come from. I can, I can kind of feel the questions um, when this goes out of going like, what about people with anxiety? What about people with depression? Mm -hmm. And I think it's, I don't think it's, that's what oh, you're saying of. Yeah. I mean, anxiety and depression are like stuck states of emotion. I don't mm -hmm. think that's not something I'm saying we should be in those places. We definitely should not. Um, but I think like constant happiness is also a stuck state of emotion. Um, yeah. we're meant to experience emotions, many of them, even in a moment. And like, you know, acting puts you in these really extreme environments where you might feel like deep sadness and the height of joy at the exact same time. And life can do that too. If you if you can get there and like, I've definitely dealt with a lot of anxiety and depression in my life and I don't want anyone to ever have to be there. And I don't think the solutions for those are simple. And I'm definitely not saying this is something you could just like buck up and do yourself, like that you can just choose to be present or you can just choose to feel a certain way. Um, but I do know for me, I'm only speaking for 
from my experience. The anxiety and depression didn't get better until I started really allowing them to, to be there. And similarly to like when I had migraines, it's like when I would feel really depressed and feel it going for more than like what felt like a short period of time, you know, with migraines, it's like on the third day of a migraine, literally my darks would get so my thoughts would get super dark. Like I, I've, I'm not going to do one more day of this. Like I don't want to do one more day of this, one more day of life. Like if this is how it's going to be. And I know depression can get there too. When I'm there, I try to do my best to remind myself it's not forever. It's not forever. It's not forever. Even if it feels like it's going to be forever, but, um, it, it's not like even when you are depressed, there are still moments that come through. And if you can, if all you can do is, you know, sit up in your bed for the day versus like laying there, like that's progress. And then all you, all you can do is look at that progress you, you made. Um, this is back to like the little things are the big things um, with mental health. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a therapist, so if I, I definitely am just saying this is what's helped me. Um, but I know anxiety and depression is, is not simple or easy. What you were just saying a second ago made me think of something that came when I was going through my first round of ADHD coaching, which was mm -hmm. a really helpful saying for me at the time, which was a win is a win. Uh, like mm -hmm. it if it's if something is a success for you and regardless of what it would be for someone else to own that success and to celebrate it you know what I'm saying like actually mm -hmm. what is that next thing i was saying like is it is it getting up out of bed is it um having a shower is it brushing your mm -hmm. teeth like and actually owning that of going like this is what success looks like because we're going to scale it to where i am right now Mm hmm yeah and it can be really hard yeah <laughs> it can because you're like this is not success like my friends like on a billboard in times square <laughs> like i can't even sit up in my bed like uh, yeah it doesn't feel like success but you know we're only us and we have <laughs> we have our bodies that we have we have our minds that we have we have our networks that we have and you can always try to improve those things but like the constant striving to improve yourself can can really make you feel pretty shitty about yourself too, actually. Yeah. Um, and you can't do anything, actually, until you just look around and see where you are. You know, if you get lost, you're never going to find your way back if you don't know where on the map you are standing when you're lost. Like, first, you have to figure out, like, where the heck am I? <laughs> okay. Now I need to go in that direction and that direction might just be like you said, taking a shower because that's better than not taking a shower. And it's going to make you feel a little bit more, you know, like yourself for the day. Um, and it's at least if it doesn't do that, it's at least going to stop you from continuing to slide backwards. So that's good. And I remember one exercise a therapist had me do, which is like, do the opposite of what you want to do. And I hated her for making me do this. I was like, oh, why do I need to do that? Like, I'm not going to do that. That sounds awful. And it truly was awful. But after a couple months, it worked. It was working. Like, she told me, okay, when you don't want to take a shower and you're really resisting taking a shower, like, I struggle with sensory sensitivity. So for me, like, sometimes taking, feeling water dripping on my face is like, the worst and I just don't want to do it um so she said just take a shower and have a towel right there so like you can immediately wipe your face when you get out you know okay fine I'm gonna just make myself take the shower make myself take the shower after a while it wasn't that hard anymore and I realized that like resisting it was harder than actually just getting it over with and she would also tell me, like, say the opposite thing of, like, what you want to say. Just, like, what? Why? Um, but it gets you out of that, the stuck, because it forces you to, like, change your behavior, and it 
makes your brain like see that the outcome is different than what it thinks it might be. Um, so you're not like constantly reinforcing your like anxiety is like a lot of fear. Um, you're not like reinforcing it anymore, but the hard part about all of this is like you, I think sometimes you just can't do it. You can't get up. You can't sit up. You can't take the shower. You just can't. And the only thing you can do is accept and wait it through. Um, like I tried really hard to get organized for my whole life and I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. I tried every tech. I took classes. I like paid money for people to come organize my house. I tried everything. And then one day I just was organized all of a sudden. I had like dealt with something else in my m emotional world and then organizing wasn't as hard anymore. And maybe that's what it is. It's not like pressuring a certain result, but just trying your best in the moment and like trusting that over time you'll get better. Um, the older I get, the more I realize like none of this stuff is linear. Like, and things are connected that you don't know are connected. Um, so that's been an interesting surprise. And I'm like, oh, okay. Now that I'm organized, like what else is going to just like take care of itself? Something. It's connected to something, I'm sure. But I it's weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was going to ask you about productivity. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of how you can... Well, you put a, a mention into the show notes of saying about mainstream productivity not working for ADHD. And yeah. I, 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 I'm feeling in a naughty mood, so I'm going to ask you, have you tried a planner? Mm. <laughs> oh my God. I have, I've like, <laughs> that was a naughty question. Um, <laughs> I have Tupperware boxes full of them and notebooks and I signed up for about six or seven different digital planners. No, I have about 30 planners in different places, some on my computer, some on my desk, some on my phone and some by my bed. And somehow they all, it all works out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah, no planners. No, I don't know how much time I wasted in my life trying to make a planner work for me. And so many people gave me planners trying to help me. And I was like, felt so bad telling them like this thing doesn't work <laughs> they're like but i love mine I'm like well <laughs> i have a special brain <laughs> yeah no i can't do it no. um i wish i had a solution for that i really don't i just trust that every adhd -er has their own super weird special system and it works for them and that's fine like do we need it to look perfect and clean as long as we get what we need out of it? Maybe not. I mean, is it the most efficient? No. But does it work enough that we get through our lives, like, good enough? Yeah, probably. Um, I don't know. It's like we could make our lives optimal or we could live our lives. So I'm just, I'm at the point of, like, not trying to optimize everything anymore. I definitely had a phase where I was like, I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. because all the productivity experts say to do that. Even though, like, my brain is the happiest to work from, like, 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. Like, why would I do that to myself? Um, and I'm sure, like, a lot of us are like that. You know, you work better at night. You work better when it's quiet. You work better. Like, I would get a lot of work done in the holidays or weekends, like, not during work hours, basically. Um, yeah, I tried the 5 a.m. wake-ups, um, planners, organizing tools. <sighs> yeah. I, I think I think it's, I think you kind of said this earlier as well, it's about knowing like where you are and what works as well. Mm. I was saying, mm -hmm. like looking back, because you have achieved stuff in your life, regardless of who you are. Like you have mm -hmm. done stuff successfully in the past and it's working out mm -hmm. 
what was different in those situations to the other situations. And yeah, yeah, and I think there's also that thing of asking the question of is it a healthy way of doing it as well? Because um, I know it, it, it in in my history of going like I would just make myself feel terrible because I hadn't done the thing and that would then motivate me to do the thing so I didn't feel quite so terrible which is not how I do things now <laughs> that's um, a really good question I'm mm. gonna add that to my like mental questions to ask myself um yeah that is so critical um it's funny like when I think about the times where it was different like where things did work or I had a success, it all comes back to was I well supported or not well supported? Like for me, at least, like when I was in college, the only semester I got of like a strong GPA was the semester where I wasn't working because I was living with my boyfriend's parents. Um, and they, so I didn't have to pay rent, I was like also paying for school. But it took like a financial burden off of me um, and they fed me meals. So like his mom would cook me three meals a day and pack me snacks. So I like was fed all day, which like now I still struggle with that. Like yesterday I didn't eat until 6 p.m. and I was about to faint. And I'm like, it sh I shouldn't be about to faint before I eat a meal. That's just but I do it all the time um, and I know better, but I still do it. Um, so just having a person prepare me meals and like make me sit down and eat them because I felt too bad to be working while I, you know, somebody made me a meal and like had me sit down at their table. Um, and those two things, like having less financial pressure and having like proper meals made the difference between like a 3.2 GPA and a 4.0 GPA. Nothing else changed. Um, my classes were harder. I was taking like grad school level classes that, that semester. And I was beating myself so much because I think school was, for me, school was like my escape. Like my form of ADHD is, is um, not the kind that is like conflicts with learning via reading. Like I've probably like dissociated half of my life by reading. So I <laughs> like school wasn't a place I normally struggled. But then when I got to college, I struggled a lot because I was working. I didn't have like a stable place to live and stuff like that. Um, so I think, I think that we often underestimate how much help we do need and like what simple things can make a big difference, like having proper meals. That's most people do that without struggle, but um, we might need more help with that. Yeah, yeah, and I I know, as a, like a single person of going like I'm not going to have that safety net, and then going mm -hmm. actually I've got um, meal prep um, shakes, so I know that it's yeah. nutritionally there. So if I don't have the spoons to have a breakfast, or I've run out of time, or I've going like I always make sure that I have something before I leave the house, even if it is. A shake that I don't particularly like, because then I, I know I've had something there, and it's it's looking after myself like in the future as well. And yeah, saying, I have like, this on my it... desk. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's sorry it's I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. It, no. I think it's, it's that thing of just saying like, and that's acceptable. Like, it's sometimes sometimes you just have to say, actually, I don't like this very much, but the alternative is not to do the thing which I know I need to do yeah yeah it's true like the the resources the resources can be simple like a like a meal prep shake um I know one thing I do struggle with a little bit is like the resourcing bit is it there's some privilege there like to be able to buy like pre prep meals or like for me sometimes like getting child care like you have to have some form of financial means or like a lot of people get support through family and not everybody has that like I don't really have that in some capacities and like 
I think one thing that's really cool about ADHD brains is that we can be super creative. Like, I think I will bet everything on an ADHD or figuring it out, you know? So it's like, you might not have a ton of resources, but you can find a, a way. Like, I was talking to somebody the other day and they said, well, I don't have money for childcare, but Ikea has a child care center where you can drop your kids off for an hour and they have a cafeteria and if you drop your kids off they give you free coffee and a, a meal voucher so they take their kid to ikea for an hour um and crank out work and it's like essentially a free meal and free child care and i was like that's so 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 resourceful and so clever and so like amazing that you did that for yourself you know like there's there is always a way and not everybody's going to go to the lengths to find it, but I do feel like an ADHD or will, because in a way it's like a fundamental pressure challenge that you've got to do anyways, because you're compelled. <laughs> yeah, and I think that there, there is definitely that thing of like, if you could make things a game, if you can take that mm -hmm. curiosity, that pattern matching, um, and go like, actually, how do, how would you solve this for someone else? It becomes a, a different mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. How would you solve this for someone else? That is great. I really, really love that. So one of my favorite yeah, coaching questions that's... is asking how you would treat someone else and would you treat yourself the same way? Mm. Yeah. Oh man, why are we so mean to ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> we know why. We know why. <laughs> it like hurts my heart. Yeah, I know, but it hurts my heart. Mm. Oh, yeah. Self compassion. That's a skill, too. All these yeah. things are skills. Like, we have to maybe it's a lot of skills we never learned, you know, because people didn't think we needed to learn them, but um, nobody gave us the tools or taught us these things. It's hard to be an adult and be like, oh, there's all these life skills I don't have. <laughs> yeah. Now I need to go figure them out. Well, everybody else is like figuring out like, you know, how to get a mortgage or how to, and I'm like, I need to figure out how to like ask for a coffee <laughs> because <laughs> I still struggle with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. But if you get those, those small skills, if you if you learn them, they will like apply to everything. They'll like scale up to those bigger things. I think I'm trying to believe that um, for myself. I think so, and I think it's that thing of I I I, I say this quite a lot. Um, like you're never going to be done. You're always going to have something to work mm. on. You're always going to be in that pursuit of the next thing mm. of the next challenge. It's that thing of like your your mental health is the same as your physical health is the same as looking after a house of like you're never gonna be finished mm -hmm. and that's okay, yeah, you're right, like the maintenance is the is the goal in a way is it true that if you don't drive a car, it'll like stop working? Yes, I feel like I yeah, heard it's... that somewhere, yeah, it seizes up, and the fuel goes bad. That's crazy to me. Like, if you don't mm. use it, it stops working. That's like, yeah. <laughs> that's like the maintenance thing. If you don't, like, use your inner tools and yourself and take care of yourself, you will stop working. <laughs> like a rusty yes. old car. Yes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, Kendra, we're just coming uh, up to the end. So, rusty old cars. how can people kind of get in touch with you and see what you're doing and follow you and all of that? Yeah, um, I'm on Instagram at the Koch Fidential, which is T H E K O C H F I D E N T I A L. Um, or you can find me on LinkedIn at Kendra Koch. Um, and I have just an open space on my calendar. Um, I can give you the link for that. And I love it when people just book calls with me and I get to meet new people. Um, sometimes I do like, brand consultations for people. Sometimes I just meet people. Sometimes I get feedback on um, what I'm building and sometimes I just make new friends. So that's also a way to get in touch. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been lovely.
That is it for today's episode of This is ADHD. You can check out the show notes and you can see all the connections and ways to reach out to Kendra and myself. Um, You can follow the podcast on threads and Instagram. Just search for This Is ADHD Podcast. And that's where you'll find updates, polls, clips from the show. And you can also engage with other listeners. Uh, You can find uh, myself and my coaching business at The Coaching Blacksmith. Um, Feel free to reach out with suggestions for future episodes or guests. Um, It's really important that these episodes are providing value. And by hearing from you, that's how I know that that's the case. Um, if you want to help support running the podcast as well, um, there is a Substack. You get a weekly newsletter, twice weekly if you go to the paid version. Um, you can find that at thecoachingblacksmith.substack.com. Um, yeah, hopefully see you soon. And as ever, I really hope that this episode has been useful for you on your ADHD journey. Thank you.